Okay, so uh, I'm going to have a small talk about Halix Valgus today. And what do we know about Halix Valgus? Um, hello? Yeah, hey, we can hear you, we can hear you. Okay, all right. So I'll, I'll get on with it. So what is Halix Valgus? Which we see a prominent medial protuberance uh, on the metatarsal phalangeal joint of the foot with a medial deviation of the metatarsal of the uh, hallux or the toe. There may be a soft tissue thickening or inflammation. The overlying bursa on the, uh, over the metatarsal uh, inflamed and swollen as well. So the combination of these conditions is known as a hallux valgus. In a layman's term, we call it as a bunion. So what are the risk factors associated uh, with this condition? What can lead to this condition? Genetic predisposition, uh, uh, but more than that, I mean, uh, on top of this, there could be some intrinsic factors as well as extrinsic factors. There could be a um, ligamentous laxity, which uh, of the first metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint leading to instability of that particular joint, which to uh, the displacements as I described earlier. The shape of the metatarsal head may be more convex than usual. Uh, deficient second toe, or there may be a deformity of the second toe, which may lead to uh, more um, angling the big toe. These planus may, be, uh, may uh, also be a leading cause of this condition as well as a pronated uh, flat foot. In the uh, extrinsic conditions, uh, narrow uh, toed shoes with high heel lead to abnormal and causing this deformity. So to uh, discuss this deformity in more detail, we need to uh, know the anatomy of phalangeal joint. If you look at these figures or these diagrams here, there's a picture. The first picture shows the joint from the lateral position. What we see here is the collateral ligaments, the ligaments attaching the sesamoids to the metatarsal and to the proximal phalanx. On the uh, other uh, <laughs> picture, we see the long extensor tendon, the, um, the long flexor tendon, um, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and the flexor hallucis brevis, as well as the adductor hallucis. These are the key muscles which lead to the uh, deformity that we see in Halex valgus condition. As we notice that the long extensor tendon passes through the three joints, okay? And the further it gets, the pull on that muscle increases, the deforming force would increase. Similarly, uh, the uh, adductor muscles uh, uh, that get attached uh, to the uh, proximal phalanx will also lead to the abnormal forces in that direction, causing that deformity. Talking about the pathophysiology, as I was talking uh, about it, that the pull of the uh, long uh, tendons as well as the conjoint adductor tendon um, leads to the abnormal forces along the joint. 
when the joint starts to get deformed uh, with, with these forces, as the deformity increases, the deforming forces, i.e. the pull of the muscles, increases in that direction and further exaggerates the deformity. As the deformity starts to establish, the medial collateral ligament uh, on, on the uh, um, torso medial side of the uh, joint starts to stretch and starts to tighten. Whereas uh, there is a, a stretch on the medial side, there, is, there are forces uh, on, on the uh, lateral side which are causing the constriction or contraction of the medial of the lateral capsule and the lateral soft tissue structures. With the pull of the lateral structures uh, or the constriction of the uh, lateral structures, the sesamoids start to get fixed and dislocate under the metatarsal head. The fibular sesamoid slips off completely and the medial uh, sesamoid gets fixed in that position. Once the uh, deformity is established, we see that the cartilage starts to damage on the metatarsal phalangeal joint. With that deformity uh, increasing, uh, the distal metatarsal, uh, met uh, the distal uh, metatarsal uh, articular angle, as well as the proximal uh, metaphyseal articular angle change. And with the increase in these angles, the deformity also increases. We come to the uh, instability uh, uh, created uh, with these uh, uh, deformities. And we really you know, sugars and also canteens. So uh, we know that uh, the uh, there are no, no, numerous uh, ways that the deformity can increase. Uh, there may be a biomechanical instability. There may be a post-traumatic instability. There may be metabolic factors. It could be the cerebral palsy leading to abnormal muscle contractures leading to this deformity. But considering all other um, uh, uh, causes of this uh, deformity, the biomechanical instability is the most common etiology uh, causing this deformity. In the uh, biomechanical instability, the contributing factors uh, that may uh, lead to uh, this deformity are stated as follows, i.e. the gastronemius or gastronemius soleus equinus, flexible or rigid piece planovalgus, uh, rigid or flexible forefoot varus, crossiflex first ray, and hypermobility of the first metatarsal, as well as short first metatarsal. How common is this uh, deformity? Uh, in US, about 1% of all adults present with this kind of deformity. The incidence of the uh, deformity increases as the age progresses. And females seem to be twice as much in, uh, affected with this deformity as the males. We need to make a thorough evaluation and examine and the patient in, com in, in completion because the, the treatment of this deformity depends on our clinical findings. So we not only need to do a musculoskeletal uh, examination, we need to do the vascular examination, we need to do a derm dermatological uh, assessment and as well as neurological assessment of this patient. 
We uh, also need to do a biomechanical examination. Hence, we need to do a complete hip examination. We need to check for gene valgum or varum. We need to look for tibial torsion, ankle joint stiffness, subtalar uh, joint uh, arthritis or stiffness, mid-tarsal uh, joint uh, um, conditions causing the stiffness, neutral uh, calcaneal uh, stance position, and forefoot or rear foot virus or valgus because all these conditions would affect the stance of the foot and would increased, uh, lead to increased pronation and rotation of the forefoot, causing uh, uh, abnormal forces on the forefoot and leading to hallux valgus deformity. We need to do a complete uh, foot examination, which would be uh, initially in weight-bearing position and then in non-weight-bearing position. We need to check the hallux position, check for rotation, a drift in the metatarsal, a translation, MTPJ range of motion, tenderness, and first ray hypermobility, as well as pain. Non-weight-bearing examination, we need to see, uh, compare that with weight-bearing examination, how the anatomy changes uh, when the patient is weight-bearing. We need to look for metatarsis adductus and, of course, hallux perches on the ground. What investigations would we be doing? Uh, we need to check for uh, routine uric acid, ESR, C-reactive protein, ANA, and rheumatoid factor, because inflammations associated uh, with the joint can cause uh, capsular, uh, capsular involvement, laxity, deformity, and hence increased chances of developing uh, forefoot uh, uh, affections. X-rays should always be taken in weight-bearing uh, position, normal AP and lateral, as well as oblique uh, views. And also, in addition, we should have sesamoid axial views. This is normal AP and lateral uh, weight-bearing X-rays. Uh, we assess the joint, we look for the deformity, uh, we say uh, measure the angles. But if we go to the oblique one, the picture on the right side of the screen, we see that we can see the uh, bony protuberance more clearly in that view. These are certain some of the angles that we tend to measure uh, with hallux valgus. The commonest is the intermetatarsal angle, which should be less than 12 degrees. This is the angle measured between the long axis of the first and the second metatarsals. The second ang angle that's important is the hallux valgus angle, which is the angle between the first metatarsal and the um, first phalanx, uh, proximal phalanx of the uh, great toe. This should be up to 15 degrees. Anything over 15 degrees would be considered as abnormal and Alex Walgus. Then is the uh, proximal uh, articular uh, set angle, uh, which is, which should again be uh, about 15 degrees. Anything more than 15 degrees uh, means an abnormal uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint configuration. This tells us about the congruity of the MTPJ. 
uh, we will discuss about decongruity uh, in the next few slides. So if you look at this picture here on the left, you see that in the first image, the maltarsal phalangeal joint is congruent and fully uh, covered uh, cartilage. In the middle picture, the uh, excess of deviation has caused the uh, joint surfaces to be partly overloaded on one side and uncovered on the other side. And in the last image, we see that the joint is now subluxed. So with measuring the um, proximal articular set angle, we would be uh, looking into this uh, situation. Now, if you look at the x-rays on, on your right, we see that the metatarsophalangeal joint is quite arthritic uh, with narrow joint spaces, sclerosis, osteophyte formation. This is important to know, um, for us to know what the joint looks like, because when we want to uh, deliver the treatment for this condition, we would only do so considering the joint status. What treatments are available? Uh, the, the treatments vary from non-operative to operative treatments. Simple correctable deformities should be uh, treated uh, non-operatively with uh, NSAIDs and simple analgesics for pain management, as well as orthotics uh, to keep the foot in neutral position and to remove any increased pressure and deforming forces on the forefoot and the hind foot. Operative uh, intervention is indicated to uh, in conditions where the pain is unbearable and the uh, deformity is progressing in a way that the joint may subluxate. What are we trying to achieve? A congruent joint. We're aiming to reduce the IM angle. We're planning to realign the sesamoids under the metatarsal, realigning the big toe with the metatarsal, maintaining and restoring the function of the foot. This is an algorithm of the uh, treatment that one should follow with Alex Valgus. If it's a congruent osteotomy, a distal osteotomy is ideal. If it's an incongruent joint with the degenerative joint disease, then yes, we would go for either a Keller's arthroplasty, which is an excision arthroplasty, usually performed in the elderly with low demands. Arthrodesis is the choice of treatment with uh, in a younger patient with high demands. We can nowadays find implants to replace the metatarsal phalangeal joint. It's a good surgery, rewarding surgery, but again, it's not suggested for people who have got uh, manual, uh, who are into manual work and or physical work because they need to use their foot to stabilize themselves fully. And in that case, arthrodesis would be a better choice of operation. Where there's no joint disease or no degeneration or arthritis, the deformity is simple. The intermetatarsal angle is less than 15 degrees or about 15 degrees. Uh, proximal uh, distal osteotomy of the metatarsal head is the ideal operation. When the inter intermetatarsal uh, angle is greater than 15 degrees and hallux angle, valgus angle is greater than 40 degrees, the shaft osteotomy or basal metatarsal osteotomy is indicated. When we do a distal uh, osteotomy, um, 
uh, Chevron is the osteotomy of the choice. It's the well-recommended osteotomy for mild to moderate deformity. Where the osteotomy, uh, where the deformity is severe, we go for um, scarf osteotomy of the metatarsal. Scarf osteotomy is a full length rotational osteotomy whereby we can correct the rotational element. We can increase or decrease the metatarsal length as well. We can improve on plant flexion or dorsiflexion of the metatarsal as well. When the <clears throat> When there, there is uh, uh, more, uh, the, the um, intermetatarsal angle is about 15 degrees, but the hallux valgus angle is more than, uh, is, is less than 40 degrees, but the toe is hypermobile um, at the metatarsal cuneiform joint, then first metatarsal cuneiform joint arthrodesis is the choice of treatment. We can choose to go for metatarsal phalangeal joint arthrodesis or basal rotational osteotomy as well in moderate deformities. There are various other osteotomies uh, described in literature. Uh, since uh, 18, uh, late 18th century, when Riverdin described the first uh, surgical correction for this disease with distal metatarsal osteotomy. Ever since, people have come up with different uh, kinds of osteotomies, i.e. Mitchell's, Wilson's, and numerous others. But the current trend is to stay focused with chevron osteotomies, or scarf osteotomy. The chevron and scarf could be combined with Aiken osteotomy, which is a closing wedge osteotomy of the um, proximal phalanx. These uh, surgical corrections or osteotomies should or should not be uh, uh, accompanied with uh, soft tissue releases. But if the deformity is such that the tissues have contracted and the passive correction is not possible, soft tissue release is more than indicated. The order of soft tissue releases, first we, dis uh, first we surgically release the conjoint adductor allucis tendon. Then we release the fibulous sesamoid ligament. We do the tenotomy of the lateral head of flexor hallucis brevis. And occasionally we do excision of fibular sesamoids. We do medial uh, capsulodesis. We do exostectomy. We spoke, we have spoken about osteotomy and resection arthroplasty as well. These are some pictures here uh, which show the distal osteotomy, i.e. chevron fix with screws. I normally tend to fix them with one K wire percutaneously which is removed in four weeks at a time. On the right, you see the metatarsal uh, uh, diaphyseal osteotomy or the shaft osteotomy, the rotational osteotomy of scarf, along with Aiken osteotomy, which is the closing value osteotomy of the proximal phalanx. None of the surgeries is safer, but however, it's a rewarding surgery and should be done where indicated. Nevertheless, there could be complications which are 
which have been um, put here together, i.e. delayed healing of the wound, malunion or non-union, neurological injury uh, leading to uh, numbness or tingling, hematoma formation, metal failure, displacement of the osteotomy, and delayed suture reaction. There could be um, avascular necrosis of the uh, metatarsal head, especially in distal metatarsal head osteotomies. There could be um, elevation of the metatarsal, um, in, uh, especially if you're doing the scarf osteotomy, if you're not careful. There may be a hallux rigidus following the uh, surgery if we lengthen the metatarsal too much, or overcorrection may lead to hallux varus. Eventually, finally, recurrence of the deformity, which is about 30%. With that, I conclude my study. If um, there are any questions, I will be uh, staying with you guys and uh, we'll be welcoming any questions towards the end. Thank you very much, Ashad. Uh, Tashmin wanted to ask a question. He raised his hand, so we'll see what he wants to say. Okay. Actually, I was just uh, looking at the clock. And I was uh, concerned about Dr. Suhail Yusuf because uh, we had given him <laughs> time, time no, off. No, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm good. Okay. So, I do apologize for, for the line. But... So it, it's just that people need to understand for the exam point of view is you need to know what a bunion is. You need to know how to measure angles. You need to know what to do. You have to make them walk. You need to see what is happening to your ankle, knee, and hip. And once you've done all that, the answer to everything is not surgery. You have to convince the examiner that I will ask the patient to have some sort of non-operative uh, intervention, sometimes spaces, sometimes, you know, all these things help. So uh, bunion does not mean surgery. That's what we need to take from this particular details. I'm sure I should agree with that, isn't it? Today, Absolutely, yes. Yeah. As I said, I mean, we, we never operate on bunions for cosmetic reasons. The only indication to operate is, you know, uh, persistent uh, pain affecting their uh, lifestyle or work conditions. So in, in this part of the world, in England, we operate on people when they can't wear shoes and they have pain. That's the simplest common, you know, reasons that is given to, to in the exam scenario. So if you all guys remember, if you can't wear your shoes and you're painful, then something has to be done. Whether it's a non-operative or operative mechanism, whether they put a space in between your toes, or they put a strapping on your toes or they do a surgical correction for it. And in the surgical correction, I think the flavor is you need to understand how big the metatarsal angle is, whether you want to do a proximal or a distal alignment, and whether you want to do an orthodesis with it. Keller's operation uh, is, is very much frowned upon in, in this part of the world, purely because you don't have a tripod gate. So if you don't have a tripod gate, you can't walk. But yes, for all people who have very little function, that is the operation of choice. In the past, it was given to soldiers if they had bunions and they were painful, they had Keller's and went back to the battlefield. But anyway, uh, thank you very much, Arshad. So who's next then? Thank you. Um, Salikum. Um, Sohail, I, I'm going to share my screen when Arshad is out. So, so I'm going out. That's it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Arshad. So my name is Sohail Youssef. I'm one of the consultants in uh, Epsom and Surrey, uh, St. Helio Hospital in Surrey. Um, this talk is available online if somebody wants to have a look at it. I worked with Derek Park, who has put this um, slides on uh, SlideShare. Uh, it's a very useful talk. Um, so um, the overview of my talk would be uh, quickly going through the pathophysiology, clinical features, investigations, conservative treatment, uh, which is the mainstay of most of the time uh, for a large majority of patients. And then there's a wide range of operative treatment. They're all a bit contentious, and we do not know what exactly is the gold standard, as with many operations and problems in orthopedics. And very briefly, when things go wrong, what can we do? Um, the pathophysiology of ankle arthritis, um, the main bit to understand it is very rare. A primary arthritis is extremely rare as compared to hips and knees. 
Uh, the reasons are numerous, but not clearly understood. But I can safely say there's an increasing incidence of secondary arthritis in the ankle. Um, it probably because of the trauma and um, badly managed ankle fractures. Uh, the normal anatomy of ankle determines its low primary wear characteristics, uh, which I talk about briefly. It is a very congruent joint. Uh, it has quite good restraints, both ligamentous and bony structures on medial and lateral side. Uh, people often forget on the posterior side, the, the PITFL, which is a very strong ligament as well. Uh, there is a um, discrepancy of the shape uh, or space between talus and ankle. And uh, it, uh, it is different from anterior to posterior. Uh, which helps to accommodate uh, in dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Um, so it has high congruency and high stability. Uh, the normal peak contact stresses which have been done in, in the labs are significantly different as compared to hip and knee. They are less and the thickness of cartilage is also quite different. It's only one to two millimeter as compared to hip and knee. So where characteristics are completely different uh, the, that's the very reason this tensile strength of cartilage can withstand long degree of stresses over a long period of time and not necessarily producing any symptoms. The factors leading to secondary osteoarthritis in addition uh, to trauma could be neuropathy which could be undetected injury or patients with diabetes. Um, the mortis is quite a complex structure. There is involvement of ligaments as well as the bone and any injury to the mortis, uh, especially a fracture or diastasis of the sinus ligament, can change the overall biomechanics of the tibiotalar joint. And in the long term, it can lead to incongruency and instability. And if the surface cartilage is incongruent, a one millimeter loss of congruency can lead to 40% increase in the contact stresses. So that is the take home message up to this point for this talk in the exam is that the um, one millimeter change, which was done in, or in a, was proven in a study uh, in 1976 by Ramsey et al. Uh, can increase to 40% contact stresses and hence increase secondary arthritis and hence the need to properly manage the ankle fractures. Uh, the, most of these studies so far have been cadaveric. There, there is a trial going on at the moment, fusion versus ankle replacement in UK and is almost finished. Some results are out. And we're hoping we'll get some more understanding of the um, characteristic of arthritis in the ankle in addition to find out fusion versus arthritis. Um, but the important bit is the x-rays do not often show full thickness of the of cartilage wear. And the grade three to four <coughs> osteoarthritis uh, is, was only visible in 80% of the ankles on x-rays in the cadaveric studies. Whereas grade three to four arthritis in knees was visible in 66% of the knees. So again, there is a bit of a dilemma in diagnosing as this condition as well. So it is less pain and less functional restriction in arthritis in ankle and also the lack of understanding and its treatment. Hence, the management is largely non-operative. Operative treatment, again, I stress, is for extremes of cases, and a large majority, no operation is often not required. The patient factor is important as, just like any other problem in orthopedics, uh, any history of trauma, recurrent ankle sprains could be due to a cable varus foot. Uh, they may have 
tendon dysfunction or ligament instability, which is causing them recurrent sprains and injuries. In England in particular, we, what terms is used called a footballer's ankle. They have repeated uh, injuries to their ankle, hence they can develop arthritis progressively. Inflammatory arthritis, again, invariably contribute towards secondary osteoarthritis. Uh, there's more uh, research into hemophilia, uh, which has seems to be some correlation with arthritis, especially of the ankle joint. Uh, gout, avian, and infection are secondary again, and we will talk a little bit about diabetes in the end. It is very important to listen to the patient. That is the key uh, message because often you can decide where the pain is coming off from the history. An uphill walking pain usually is a classic representation in a anterior ankle impingement. Whereas downhill walking pain is a posterior ankle arthritis, which is very difficult to diagnose. Walking on uneven ground pain is the subtalar arthritis. But as you remember from our medical school days, the range of motion at the ankle is only plantar flexion and the dorsiflexion of the tibiotalar. Whereas inversion and eversion happen on a subtalar joint. So in the exam, if you take a history and patients tell you he cannot walk on an uneven surface, and he's complaining of pain around the ankle, it is more likely originating from subtalar joint rather than the ankle joint itself. One of the classical subfibular pain is usually related to long-standing ankle ligamentous instability or subtalar joint arthritis. Very rarely calcaneal impingement or peroneal uh, tear can also present with subfibular pain. In summary, I think uh, whether the pain is on dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is important to know. It's important to know whether you are getting pain on walking on uneven surface. And it's very important that the pain is subfibular and can be confirmed on the clinical examination. Um, in addition to this, a in a standing posture, looking at the overall alignment of the hind foot from front and back and side is very important. Looking at the gait, examine the neurovascular status. Examine the skin carefully because of the signs of neuropathy can be obvious from your skin examination. You can pick up signs and symptoms of diabetic neuropathy. There could be features of vasculitis in rheumatoid patients. Uh, I have put down here as a point of maximal tenderness, but I always ask my patient, where is the pain? And I focus where the patient points towards the pain. And in the exam, I would ask you for any foot and ankle case, ask them where is the pain and if they can point where the pain is. That would give you about 60% or 70% of idea what the problem is. And then you look at the range of motion. The range of motion in ankle is slightly tricky to examine. In England, in my fascius exam, I thought they, one of my examiners told me the rate limiting or step in the exam for progression is people unable to perform a range of motion at ankle joint. So you have to neutralize the talus to examine it and then check the a range of motion at the ankle as well as subtalar joint in a tailor neutral position. Then you look for ligament stability and any evidence of tendinopathy. X-rays are important. We always get a weight bearing X-ray. Um, I do some work in Pakistan. I know it's difficult to get weight bearing X-ray and most of the time machines do not go down enough. Sometimes you have to get the patient on a stool, get the patient up. If the machine cannot go down, you make them arrange something where they can stand on. And we can do an AP and lateral views. Uh, in this particular X-ray on a weight bearing, you can see there is collapse of the, uh, sub, um, the tibial tailor joint as well as the subtalar joint on this X-ray on the lateral view. There is some changes in the talonavicular joint, especially this osteophyte in front of the tailor neck. It's very important to appreciate that because sometimes the talonavicular joint pain is more persistent and more prominent, and we are unable to distinguish between a ankle or a um, talonavicular joint pain. 
Um, CT is excellent uh, for um, imaging modality. Uh, it can also provide uh, further information with the use of a dye in terms of an arthrogram, or sometimes we can get a SPECT CT scan to look at the metabolic activity, whether it is coming from the ankle joint or subtalar joint. In my practice, the role of the CT usually is to see how much bone stock is available for me to plan any ankle replacement procedure or an ankle fusion procedure. Um, arthrograms and steroid injections uh, is the normal process of investigation as far as I am concerned for management of ankle pain. If there is advanced arthritis, I will always inject uh, under image guidance into the uh, tibiotilar joint. If the pain goes away completely, I'm more confident that I can manage this patient uh, with a surgical procedure and I have a good result. If the pain does not disappear completely, and there's some persistent pain, that means the pain may be originating from a subtalar joint or a telonavicular joint. In that case, sometimes you have to do injections in the neighboring joint at a later stage. It is not the treatment for ankle arthritis. It will only relieve pain for a short period of time. Patients should be aware the symptoms can come back. We only use 0.25% bupivacaine in an arthrogram because the 0.5% bupivacaine or chirocaine has shown damage uh, to the cartilage itself. Uh, there is limited value of MRI scan because the joint space is often narrow. You will have some uh, degenerative changes in the joint, but it may not be representation of the symptoms. In terms of management, um, non-operative treatment should be the first uh, step and depending upon the patient's symptoms, if often require uh, insoles, some uh, in a fixed deformity, you provide an accommodative arthrosis. In a correctable deformity, you provide a corrective arthrosis. If you try to put a rigid arthrosis in a fixed deformity, it will only make things worse. So it is important to appreciate whether the deformity or the problem, uh, this, uh, the arthritis is to a degree where there's a stiffness or a movement still present. In terms of operative treatment, the options are arthroscopic debridement, only in earlier degree of patients and where there is a clear sign of interior or posterior impingement, because you can debride the anterior tail and neck and the distal end of the tibia to increase the dorsiflexion. and may not necessarily have to do a full debridement of the ankle. The Periankle osteotomies are running out of favor, may be limited in very advanced post-traumatic severe varus or valgus deformities in young patients. Arthroplasty is an excellent option, but it is difficult, it's challenging, and revision procedures are also quite difficult in the long run. So it is only reserved for selective patients and I will come to that in a minute. In our part of the world where I'm working, the arthrodesis seems to be the gold standard. It, is, it can be open as well as close. Initially, up to 10 to 15 degree a various of valgus angulation was considered suitable for arthroscopy and beyond that people will do open uh, fusion. But I personally have now tried quite severe deformities and I have good results uh, with arthroscopic. I have done only two open arthrodesis in the last 18 months. Ankle joint distraction uh, is a newer but unproven technique where you distract um, an ankle in a younger patient and are hoping to re-achieve some revascularization, especially if there are post-traumatic changes in talus. You have to be very careful about the patient selection, but it can take a long time before they come out of the ankle distraction. 
ankle arthritis is based on the premise that will stop movement at the ankle, which are pain, thought to be the painful stimuli. However, you are risking more movements in the neighboring joints and they have to work harder and they can become arthritic in long term. Um, there are not many good long-term studies showing the results of the ankle fusion or any comparative study, open versus closed versus total ankle replacement. They are mostly case series and they're ranging from 60 to 100% success rate. In terms of the principles of orthodesis, you have to correct the alignment of the hind foot as a whole. If you have any deformity at the knee, the, the results of the ankle arthritis will be suboptimal if you have not corrected it first. I always get my knee specialist colleagues to have a look at it if I'm concerned, and if they require a knee replacement, they will do it before I go down to the ankle. But the general rule of thumb for orthopedics, you only st always start from the higher end. So we correct the deformity of the knee first if it is required. Uh, in the sagittal plane, aim for a five to 10 degrees of plantigrade foot. In the coronal plane, you have to correct the varus and valgus and aim for a neutral alignment. And in the rotation alignment, a 10 degrees of external rotation is required or acceptable. An internal rotation would be a complete disaster. A patient would not be able to walk in a straight line. And they would not be able to do a ground clearance and they will fall. Avoid too much equinus, avoid too much dorsiflexion. They all have problems. This is your exam answer. That in a tibio Taylor fusion, you should be aiming to fuse the ankle in a five to seven degrees of hind foot valgus. In terms of doing an open versus close or arthroscopic procedure, soft tissue respect is paramount. Superficial peroneal nerve and the saphenous nerve both will be in the way of the surgery and they should be avoided um, any injuries or painful neuroma will alter your results. Remove all the cartilage and it, ha it requires lots of practice and patience to remove all the cartilage because some of the ankle or cartilage can be quite posterior and the talus is a very hard bone and taking the cartilage out from the talus is not easy. We must get subchondral bleeding bone and it create a congress cancellous surface that can be opposed and I very rarely use a bone graft. Uh, I have done it if I'm doing a revision ankle replacement to a fusion where there's a large defect and usually a bone graft is required. And once you have achieved the uh, a position, uh, provide a rigid internal fixation and you, then you have to protect that fixation for about three months. In the man's technique, which is a textbook technique, you have to excise the uh, fibula and then you provide uh, by doing an oblique osteotomy and get access to the joint, distract the joint, prepare the cartilage and run two parallel screws which should not be convergent, they should be divergent. In the man's technique, they have a separate incision for over the medial malleolus or over the medial gutter to prepare the medial gutter and achieve union. As you have excised the fibula, you're not worried about the lateral gutter, but if you do not prepare the medial gutter, then it will cause pain and the results will not be optimal. The rehabilitation um, period is about three months. In the first six weeks, patient and non-weight bearing or touch weight bearing, in a plaster cast followed by partial weight bearing for six weeks. And you remove the cast at three months and sometimes you require a boot for um, another three to four weeks. Um, most of the studies have suggested that patient satisfaction is about 70%. 
the dissatisfaction is due to pain, non-union, limp or wound infection. In my own personal practice, the dissatisfaction is due to poor understanding of the rehabilitation period. How long will it take the ankle to settle down? So I tell them it takes about nine months to a year for the ankle to settle down. The three months you will be out of the cast, but the ankle to settle down completely may take nine months to a year. Uh, the anterior pressure of the ankle, you must all should be able to draw a cross section of the ankle and the structures uh, from medial to lateral side. It should have a mnemonic and it should come out very quickly. Uh, but I use an interval between EHL and EDL. Uh, the superficial uh, pronin nerve is retracted laterally with the deep neurovascular bundle. Um, EHL also routinely goes medially. Uh, the structure you will see in front of you will be retinaculum. You divide the retinaculum and also down to it, it'll be deep, um, the periosteum. It's quite thick and in front of the ankle joint. Once you have exposed the ankle joint, then you have to prepare the joint thoroughly. Uh, reposition the periosteum because as I mentioned, it's quite thick. It is quite possible to put a couple of stitches into the periosteum. Retinaculum must be repaired. Otherwise, the tendons will may keep on slipping and will cause discomfort. And coming out will be subcutaneous tissues and the skin. Uh, I've already touched briefly on the arthroscopic ankle arthritis. Um, I think I'll run out of the time if I go further into the detail. Um, the setup for um, the ankle, arthroscopic ankle arthritis is, is critical. Your knee goes into five to 10 degrees of flexion. The foot should be right at the edge of the table. And an ankle distractor is used uh, if you have the facilities. If you do not have the ankle distractor, you tie a ribbon gauze around your waist and a distractor through the heel and the midfoot of the patient, get the patient into a five to 10 degrees, a reverse Trendelenburg position and ret retract the joint with your own weight. The, there are two portals normally, anteromedial and anterolateral portal. The anterolateral portal, there is a high risk of damage to the superficial peroneal nerve. It should be clearly visualized before you start the operation to get the foot into a plantar flexion, of gentle plantar flexion, hold with the fourth ray and slightly invert the subtalar joint. You should be able to feel or see the super, superficial peroneal nerve. The entry on the anteromedial side should be a soft spot between the tibialis anterior and the medial malleolus. For that soft spot, spot, put your thumb in the medial gutter and bring the ankle into a neutral with your weight of your tummy and you should be able to feel a soft spot. There is a small risk of damage to the softness nerve if you're not very careful. Uh, we have talked about uh, preparing all the cartilage to check whether you have achieved a well perfused uh, surface. Some people uh, release the tunica. I don't because it makes life very difficult. Uh, I, I uh, rely on presence of fat globules in within my operative field. If you have penetrated the subchondral plate, you should be able to see the fat globules. Uh, these are some of the pictures which are showing the uh, ankle arthroscopic uh, fusion and followed by the cannulated screw. Four, two uh, 6.5 millimeter cannulated screws are inserted from medial to lateral side. Uh, care should be taken that you, you know, do not penetrate to the subtalar joint. It takes a little while to understand uh, where the subtalar joint is on an x-ray, but it is a critical part of the operation. Again, the patients have reported about 80 to 90% success uh, with the arthroscopic ankle fusion with very little soft tissue problems. Most of the issues with ankle, uh, arthroscopic ankle arthrosis are with uh, non-union if the joint is not properly visualized. In addition, patient or smoker or diabetic is slightly more at risk of having a non-union arthrosis. 
complication of ankle arthritis is an infection, neurovascular injury, delayed in non-union, uh, malalignment is purely technical. Uh, painful hardware requiring removal is quite um, usual with a long uh, anterolateral plate with an open arthrodesis, whereas the arthroscopic arthrodesis, I rarely have to remove any screws. And the problem with the subtalar joint penetration on x-rays. Uh, total ankle replacement, uh, the jury is not out yet. There are, it's a good technique for selected patients. You retain your range of motion and the neighboring joints are not as much as affected as compared to the arthrodesis. However, as the 10 year survival rate is, uh, failure rate is something about 8.9 to 9% with most of the implants which is not great as compared to the knee replacement or hip replacement. The um, problems with ankle replacement is loosening of the implants, especially on the talus, which is a smaller bone, quite hard and have a very precarious blood supply. So it can loosen more rapidly as compared to the tibia. There are different designs which are cemented and uncemented. At the moment, the, most of the implants are a uncemented prosthesis with a mobile bearing um, surface, which seems to have shown better results. These are some examples of different uh, ankle replacement design in the market. And the approach for ankle replacement is the same for, as it for the uh, ankle, open ankle arthrodesis and uh, an anterior approach is uh, mostly used. The long-term results, as I said, in the TAWA study is finishing and the results are coming out. We, we still don't have more than 10 years follow-up or 15 years follow-up for the newer implants. So I, I would safely quote about 8.9 to 9% failure rate at 10 years. Um, what about the special cases, especially of the AVN of the talus? One must get a CT scan to see whether there is any, uh, how much bone stock is available. And then uh, you progress to a fusion as usual. Um, it is very important to evaluate the subtalar joint in these cases as because of the collapse, there is sometimes involvement of the subtalar joint and even a hind foot uh, fusion is quite tricky. Um, I think this is beyond the scope of this talk. Um, the ankle distraction technique um, is new. Um, it is not validated yet as a standard treatment. There are few case series been published, but I would, um, for the exam purpose, focus mainly on non-operative treatment, fusion, open versus arthroscopic, and selected patient and ankle replacement. In the neuropathic patients, which is the entered arthritis, uh, fusion is perhaps the only option, and sometimes you have to do a uh, subtalar as well as the ankle joint fusion with a hind foot nail. Um, what are the risks or when the things go wrong? As I mentioned, smokers, patients who have immunocompromised status, which is not evaluated properly, previous history of infection, bad soft tissue envelop or soft tissue damage during surgery, not been able to withstand or comply with plaster cast immobilization, and elderly patients. Again, it is very difficult to keep them non weight bearing. I tend to put them in a full plaster and allow them some sort of weight bearing. Uh, definition of non-union is when it's continue to have pain, nine months a year, I don't know. I evaluate the x-rays, get a CT scan about nine months time. If there's no signs of union, we we'll proceed to a revision. The principle of treatment for this problem is deal with the patient expectation. If there is non-union and infection, they should be aware there is a risk of a baloney amputation. They should 
be able to understand the rehabilitation process. And it may take months, if not years, for the ankle to settle down completely. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, the, the thing to understand from here for the, uh, for the guys who are doing the exam is it's a rare condition. It's a very rare condition. You must know the principles of management of these patients with ankle arthritis. Obviously, non-operative, taking the weight off and various other things can help. Steroids are a test. It's not a treatment, so please don't keep giving steroids to everybody all, day and all year long. I was in Pakistan uh, only a couple of weeks ago, and we did this shoulder who was getting 1,500 rupees injection <laughs> every week for nearly a year. You know, so please, injection does not help. It's only a test. Uh, you must know the principles and the approaches to the ankle because that's what's asked in the exam. Uh, I would stay away from talking about ankle replacements because in Pakistan, it's still a novelty. As In America and England, it's still a novelty. Not many people do it. But if you're right. pushed into a corner, then you can talk about ankle replacement. says, I'm aware of it. It happens, but I have no experience of it. That's probably what will save you. Um, if, if, if you have questions, it's now time to take. Or otherwise, we'll move on to the next stage. Yeah, yeah sure. Anybody want questions? You completely over, over, overwhelmed them, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much for listening, guys. Question. Yeah, should we move? Thank you very much for your talk, yeah? <laughs> which, which, uh, uh, sorry, which approach do you use usually for your ankle orthodesis? Ankle? Orthodesis, like uh, you said you use an arthroscopic approach, but uh, do you do a medial approach or a lateral? Which approach do you use? Usually? Yeah, so we, in the middle of the talk, I didn't mention. Um, so the anterior approach to the ankle between the interval of EHL and EDL. All right. Uh, it is a midline, almost a midline incision. So you must know your anatomy in the front. With the, with the uh, EDL, you can take your uh, neurovascular bundle away on the medial side and the, you, the EHL you retract laterally and you take the superficial peroneal nerve with it. So you will have a very good um, access to the front of the ankle. So that is almost a midline incision. Uh, and it's, I do not do a separate incision for the medial gutter. Uh, when, if you do a sub a fibular excision, uh, that in that case, you have to make an incision at the tip of the fibula along the fourth ray and curve it along to the anterior border of the fibula. At this point, you are at risk of damaging the superficial peroneal nerve. That's your exam answer. So on the tip of the fibula down to the fourth ray, the structure at risk is your superficial peroneal nerve. <laughs> you do an oblique osteotomy, remove the fibula and distract the ankle from a lateral approach. In that case, you have to do a separate incision over the medial malleolus to get to the medial gutter. You cannot get to the medial side from a fibular excision. So you must do a second approach. So these are two different techniques. If you're just putting a screw, I would use a subfibular uh, a, a tip of the fibula approach. If I'm putting a plate in front of the ankle, which is mostly for revision cases, then I do a midline anterior approach. Good. Okay. So if nobody has any more questions, can we move on to the next talk? Yeah. Thanks a lot. So is it Rizwan Saab or is it Tashwin Saab who's doing next? I will be doing. Oh, good. Let's start then. Let's get into it. So, so I need Dr. Nasser to uh, stop screen share so that I can. Do you want to stop sh screen sharing, uh, Nasser? You need to come out. Good. So what you want to yeah. All yours, Rizwan, you can share now. Yes. So can any, everybody see my slides? And we can see a, a group of uh, a PowerPoint presentation, but no slides coming up yet. So now you can see? No. You can see your uh, desktop with all the 
Slides on it. On it. Soon. Now can you see? Is it going? Is it going to an extended desktop? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You can see your arrow moving, and we can see all the PowerPoint presentations, but we don't yeah. see the PowerPoint yet. I, th I think, Dr. Rizwan, you need to share again. Close the okay. share and start again. Okay. Rizwan, is it opening on your computer? Yes. Hmm. So I will share again. There you go. We've got tailor's fracture now. Yeah. That's good. So my name is Dr. Rizwan. I will be just going through various uh, common uh, foot and ankle fractures, uh, hind foot and uh, midfoot. So as you know that uh, uh, the fracture of the talus are not very common and it accounts only for about 0.1% of all the fractures. And it is the second most common tarsal bone to be injured after the calcaneus. And since it's picorious blood supply, these are very difficult fractures and are mostly challenging. Yeah, the uh, fractures of the talus can be classified according to their anatomical location. So I will be more concentrating on the talus neck fractures. So head can be fractured, body can be fractured, there can be a combination of fractures. So most of the time, uh, talus neck fractures are around 45%. So talus has got a very uh, peculiar blood supply. It is basically supplied by the anterior tibial artery, basically the neck part. And uh, the body is basically supplied by the posterior tibial artery, via the artery of the tarsal canal. So there is a specific mechanism of injury. So when your foot uh, is stuck in the dorsiflex position, you continue to increase your dorsiflexion and the tibial fephon hit the tail and neck. And most of the time, this is the major mechanism of injury. So with increasing dorsiflexion forces, there is disruption of the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. Posterior tibiotalar joint capsule leads to subluxation or complete dislocation of the talus. So mostly the talus will rotate about the intact deltoid ligament and come to rest between the posterior aspect of the medial malleolus and the Achilles, where the neurovascular structures can be compromised. So we all know that talar fractures are classified, neck fractures are basically classified by Hawkins. Type 1, this is undisplaced. Type 2, uh, 1A, a, 2A and 2B, there is a subluxation at the subtalar joint. 3 is subluxation at the subtalar but and tibiotalar. And finally, the, if it is associated with tibio uh, uh, tibiotalar joint, so this is type 4. Each has this uh, significance in, uh, expect, uh, in, uh, in the prognosis after talus uh, So, avascular necrosis rate, as we can see, that type 3 are uh, associated with about 86% of uh, times of uh, AVN. But recently, a study by Dodd said that the avascular rate after talus fracture fixation has came down because of the increased understanding and better availability of implants. So uh, we have to clinically evaluate the case. Uh, urgent reduction in the emergency room is indicated to reduce the risk of osteonecrosis and skin compromise. Close reduction is attempted with knee flexion along with plantar flexion, inversion, and eversion. So repeated forceful attempts should be avoided and should be considered as a surgical urgency. Open fracture as principles are you usually do urgent irrigation and debridement. So there are certain specific use for uh, talus. Canal and Kelly uh, view describe a uh, talus neck which is called uh, which is obtained by 15 degree of eversion and anti and angling the beam uh, 75 degree from the horizontal. 
So the gold standard is for fracture configuration is to have a CT scan. So this is how you take a canal and Kelly view. Pronation at 15 degrees, 50, 75 degrees, cephalate from horizontal, and you get this full profile of the talus. So there are certain, as with all, we know that there are certain treatment goals. We need to have an anatomical reduction, restoration of articular surface, axial alignment, and preservation of motion with minimization of complication, including AVN, post-traumatic arthritis, malunion, non-union, and infection. Non-operative is very rarely integrated unless and unless it is a very subtle, undisplaced Hawken type fractures, and that too should be assessed by a CT scan. So biomechanical studies have demonstrated that as little as 2 mm of displacement significantly alters subtalar contact forces. But if you want to label a case like an undisplaced fracture, you need to have a CT scan. So for undisplaced fracture, non-weight bearing cast for six weeks and or until radiographic union, it, it may take up to 12 weeks. Operative management, something about operative management. The current standard is for all displaced stellar neck is ORIF. Close reduction is usually difficult and when possible, it is preferable to proceed directly to operative fixation to avoid multiple unsuccessful reduction attempts. Various surgical approaches have been uh, described. Uh, the most important is, thing is to take care of the soft tissue. Otherwise, you will end up in a soft tissue necrosis. The anteromedial approach to the talus involves making an incision medial to the anterior tibial tendon. The major disadvantage is lack of visibility of the lateral aspect, which is necessary to judge the quality of reduction, as you can see from here. The anterolateral approach is performed with an incision between the tibia and the fibula in line with the fourth ray. So mostly this is a combination of two, anterolateral and anteromedial. So this approach allows for the lateral anatomical reduction of the lateral part. Uh, sometimes the fibular ostotomy is also uh, can be considered for gaining access to the proximal little talus. So you have to be very careful whenever because the major supply after the teller neck fractures are is coming from the deltoid artery which is a branch of the uh, posterior tibial artery anterior tibial artery and we have to save that thing otherwise you will end up in a complete you will the most of the side is uh, avascular and by dissecting on the medial side you violate the deltoid artery so you end up in a disaster or any means so this is the anterolateral approach mark. So sometimes uh, you have to use a posterior lateral approach, uh, just lateral to the Achilles and developing uh, the interval between the FHL and the peroneum. This approach can be used to facilitate leg screw fixation. As the screw trajectory is perpendicular to the fracture line and care should be taken to prevent injury to the peroneal artery and the saphenous nerve. This is a small diagram. When to do surgery? So initially it was thought that teller neck fractures are orthopedic emergency with immediate reduction and it will decrease the incident of osteonecrosis. But recently things have changed a bit and that osteonecrosis may be strongly correlated to other factors such as open fractures and the Hopkins classification. The more the commission, the worse the outcome. So until the soft tissue is healed, uh, surgery should be delayed. And but you have to be careful that if it, there is a dislocated talus, you need to reduce. The, the delaying surgery doesn't mean dislocated talus and you just wait. So you reduce it temporarily by wire and just wait for the soft tissue until you do your definite fixation. So percutaneous for undisplaced fractures. So there is a, uh, you can use screws only or plates and screws. So screw fixation alone was a predominant method of teller neck displaced fractures in early series. So screws can be performed as you can see from anterior posterior or posterior to anterior. Whenever you are putting an anterior to posterior screws, there are chances that the inferior surface can just uh, open up 
and can end up in a non union or mall union because the tele navicular joint doesn't allow you to go in line so that's why posteriorly definitely you have got a better chance to have an anatomical uh, reduction so in, in whenever you are using screws in uh, tellers it is important to remember that the use of lag screws in the setting of any combination will lead to mal alignment you start to compress in uh, combination and it will just compress 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 leading in mal alignment so in this case screw should be used as a positional screws so can be used to maintain an anatomical reduction on the medial side and avoiding compressing a comminuted fracture into wares so plate reduction with, with the advent of more smaller plates like 1.5 2.0 mm plates so wherever there is comminution you put in a plate and you can put a positional screw as well so areas of convention should be packed with bone graft to provide structure support the plate may be placed either medially or laterally depending on the location of combination this is a, just an example where you can see a combination so post op rehabilitation is usually early range of motion once the wounds are healed if there is concern regarding the integrity of fixation or in cases of significant ankle subtalar or tendonary casting for 6 weeks is recommended the patient should remain non wedbearing until there is evidence of sufficient healing on radiographs and typically it takes about 3 months after injury so this was about a quick review of the uh, talus fractures so i will be just uh, going through the calcaneal fractures as well quickly so can you see my dr munawar can you see my calcaneal fracture slide no okay i will just wait now we can yeah so uh, so the calcaneus is the most frequently injured tarsal bone as we discussed 75 of percent of these injuries are usually intraarticular and almost all occur due to axial load just as falling from a height so most of the time you have to follow the atls principles in this whenever there is a calcaneal fracture look for other injury you have to examine from cervical spine till the calcaneus you have to examine the knee joint you have to examine the spine as well so most of the time about 10% of the injuries are bilateral and fewer than 5% are open dr rizwan can you start the slide show mode okay sorry so many calcaneal fractures are usually work related so worker compensation is an issue with calcaneal fractures and usually the males are the most commonly affected gender and the age group is between the 35 or 45 years when they are at the peak of the career or earning so these fractures frequently result in long term disability with potentially severe economic impact on the patient so the pathotomy is intraarticular incongruently with the development of arthritis or arthrosis of the subtalar joint the lateral wall is usually blown out and it causes peroneal tendon or calcaneofibular impingement so the varus mal alignment of the heel is a problem the widened heel due to the lateral bulge is a problem and the heel height is also shorter so that's why the medulla are very close to the ground and cause impingement as well and difficult shoe wearing so decreased ankle dorsiflexion is caused by the relatively dorsiflex position of the talus with the within the crest calcaneus so elevated achilles tendon insertion leading to weakening of the gastroc complex and shortening of the calcaneus resulting in a decreased lever arm upon which the gastroscoliosis complex can work so this is the problem which we have with the calcaneal fracture it is not only the intraarticular fracture but the other things which are associated with calcaneal fractures so usually you see a very bad skin 
So wrinkling is the sign where uh, you have to delay surgery until you find wrinkling. With the advent of the minimally invasive sinus tarsi approach, so it is uh, it is has now become easier to operate on these uh, calcaneal fractures. So we need to have a radiographic evaluation, the lateral view, the Harris axial views, Broden view, and you have to have a CT scan whenever you are looking, whenever you are dealing with a patient of uh, calcaneus fracture. So this is the Harris axial view. As you can see, this gave a full profile of the calcaneum. So this is how it is taken. So intraoperatively, we usually uh, uh, Look at the broadens view so to assess our uh, reduction and reduction of the subtalar joint. So the the beam is uh, 10 to uh, degree to 40 degree, and the foot is internally rotated from 70 degree to 30 degree. So CT scan is very important in uh, classification of the injury as well as to counsel the patient about the possible outcome of the calcaneal fractures. These are the normal radiographic signs which you can see. This is the Bollard's angle. The Bollard's angle is usually uh, and is the normal range is around 25 to 40 degree, and there is the angle of the Gizan. So the range is around 95 to 105 degree. So normally there are two types of injury. Uh, so basically, what happens the lateral polar once you have an axial loading. So the lateral process of the talus hits the calcaneum just, uh, and it splits the calcaneum into pieces. So the Essex leprosity classification is very easy to know the mechanism and the basic general type of the fracture. So there is a depression type in which the joint line exits through the subtalar joint. And there is a tongue type which are easier to manage as compared to intraarticular uh, depression type because the fracture line exit outside the subtalar joint mostly posteriorly. So the Sanders classification is another, it's very, it's very difficult to reproduce and it needs a very uh, repeated uh, seeing of the CT scans. So the more than a Sanders type 3B, AB has got a bad prognosis as compared to type 2. So the treatment is basically for non displays is conservative treatment and you can just put a patient on Jones dressing until the initial mm, uh, swelling subsides. So the dressing can be replaced by a removable splint or boot to begin range of motion. Exercises of the ankle and uh, ankle and more important the subtalar joint otherwise joint arthrosis will be there. So no, normally the weight bearing thing is to be uh, lasted for about six weeks. Some patients with displaced intraarticular calcaneal fracture may be better, may be better treated without surgery. If, you, the guy, if the patient has got significant comorbids, heavy smokers and non-compliant. So you don't treat because it's very, uh, so the post-op DI will be very, will be very troublesome if you operate on these things. So mostly, most of the intraarticular fractures are best treated with lateral extensile approach, but this was an initial thing. Uh, so you can either, uh, this is only, uh, the patient is on uh, lateral position. This is the mark, the extensile approach. So you have to raise the flap as a full thickness flap. Uh, you have to visualize the fracture. This is a very good way you put uh, K wires in the tailors, uh, the cuboid and this, this they act as a retractor. So you have to be very gentle with skin retraction whenever you are using a lateral extensile approach. Otherwise you will end up in very disastrous skin condition. So since the lateral extensile approach has got its own uh, cons in the form of difficult wound management. So the sinus tarsi approach is mostly nowadays used. So these are the plates, uh, the, they are, these are custom made plates. We have this in Pakistan as well. So we use this thing now, me and Dr. Tashwin does a lot of these things in our center. So you just put in, just uh, so uh, you don't have to explore the entire, uh, no super dissection of the skin. So chances of uh, infection and skin breakage is less. So here you can see one of, our, one of the cases. 
The post of care after open reduction, these injuries are typically placed in a well padded compression splint at 90 degrees plantigrade and used in uh, two to three months of non weight bearing. So, with solid stable fixation, subtalar joint range of motion is usually started after wound healing is completed. So, physical therapists and gait training exercises are very important in this as well. So the most severe complication of calcaneal fracture is a wound infection. You have to understand from MCQ. I got this MCQ when I was giving my FCPS. So which usually follows delayed wound healing. Some studies have documented rates of wound complication greater than 40%. So this is for lateral extensile approach, not the MIS approach. So the skin wrinkles are the time when to operate these calcaneal fractures. So other risks include the arthrosis of the subtalar joint with stiffness in spite of open reduction and internal fixation with early motion or post-traumatic arthritis of the subtalar joint. So this was about the talus. So Dr. Tashwin, I should do the list frank as well. So I think that's an important example aspect. If you have a few slides and then we clear the concept, that'd be a good idea on, on this fancy. So okay, it. so it will take maximum 10 minutes. Yes, I completely agree. It's a very important topic. Okay, sir. Okay. So can you see my list we, next we, slide? We, yes, we still have. Going to PowerPoint. We still, we still have a good number of participants, so please go on. Okay, okay. So, List Frank, so it was named up as, uh, after. Can you see my slides now? Nah? Yes, yes, yes. List Frank injury is an eponymous term. It was named after the Napoleon surgeons during the Napoleonic Wars, and it is referred to a com uh, injury to the TMT complex. So, List Frank injury is not a single injury, it's the injury of the complex. So it usually includes the TMT joints, the intermetatarsal ligaments, and the associated intercuniform joints. The injury may be purely ligamentous, bony, or more commonly a combination of both. So they are usually, they range from undisplaced to fractured dislocation of some of all the TMT joints. So it is not a very common injury, one per 55,000 per year in US. So men are most commonly affected. So, List frank is one of the fractures which is included in the miss injury as well. So usually the general orthopedic surgeons they just see and sometimes there are chances you can miss uh, the list frank fracture because you have to have a weight bearing X-ray. There's Doctor Sohel told us. Anatomy is uh, the list frank is composed of the tarsal, metatarsal, intermetatarsal, and the anterior intertarsal joints. Each of the medial three metatarsal articulates with the cuneiform, the medial, middle, and the lateral cuneiforms, while the lateral two metatarsal articulates with separate facets to the cuboid. So this is a very good uh, slide. We can see that uh, what is the articulation between the metatarsals and the cuneiforms. And this is the, we always say Roman arch, Roman arch. So this is the Roman arch. If you take this thing, the entire arch would collapse. So this is another example of Roman arch. So the, 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 the list frank is that's why very important injury. If there is an injury and miss, so the entire midfoot will collapse. So biomechanically, the list frank represents the transition from midfoot to forefoot and is therefore crucial for a normal gait pattern. So, so we, we usually divide the foot into the medial column. It has got around uh, 10 to 20 degrees of motion and 5 to the intermediate column and the lateral column. So the intermediate column is the most rigid of all. So that is where the list frank lies. So the mechanism of injury can refer, range from low energy to high energy and the most common is direct injury usually to the dorsum of the foot uh, such as high velocity blunt trauma. Hyper plantar flex foot uh, mostly sporting injuries and such as footballs. As you can see the mechanism of injury. So the second metatarsal usually displays dorsally. 
first the dorsal ligaments are disrupted which are uh, very weak then the stronger plantar or listrang ligaments and finally bony injury to the varying degrees there is no correlation between mechanism and type of fracture pattern but due to high energy and potential soft tissue involvement direct listrang injuries are shown to have worse outcomes so this is the components of the listrang ligament you can see that it is extending till the third metatarsal the c1 and m2 are the metatarsals so cuneiform sedega second metatarsal the, the interosseous part the dorsal part and the plantar part despite the abundance of various classification are there so this is a kenu and kus classification a mersel classification whatever it is easier to remember but you should know the name of the classification and the general pathology general um, uh, idea of how they classify so usually whenever you are seeing a listrang suspected listrang injury you have to look for the soft tissue status of the patient the presentation of a painful swollen midfoot following foot trauma should alert the physician to this injury examination will reveal a swollen midfoot with tenderness and pain on passive movements of the midfoot so plantar ichymosis is a key diagnostic factor for diagnosing listrang injury and whenever you are seeing a listrang you don't have to forget the foot compartment syndrome so if you don't treat them so they usually end up with a gap sign so initial imaging should consist of ap lateral and 30 degrees oblique view for visualization of the tmt the ap view should be taken with x ray 15% or 15 degree of the vertical plane so sometimes it is very important to have uh, stress views particularly in subtle injuries so these are the various radiological factors which you can which you have to see whenever you are looking so we will discuss so this is uh, the sign when the medial uh, when the second metatarsal is not in line with the medial cuneiform third so on uh, on the right of the screen there is a flex sign which is an avulsion of the listrang ligament which should raise the suspicion of listrang injury so here you can see that this is congruous the fourth and the third metatarsal are congruous with the medial border of the cuneiform medial border of the cuboid and the cuneiform this should be there and this is a suspicious sign whenever you see this so there is dorsal subluxation of the second tmt so you have to be very aware you have to be very vigilant on this so non surgical treatment is usually a patient who have got stable injury pattern or who, those who cannot tolerate surgery the key to successful non surgical management of listrang injury is to rule out surgical subtle instability which means stress views or weight bearing x rays in a patient with stable injury patterns treatment consists of non weight bearing immobilization in a boot or short leg cast return to function is usually in 4 to 6 months doctor uh, be foot and ankle you have to counsel the patient well about the post operative outcomes and what to expect surgical management is usually when there is instability of the tmt joint complex most injuries are initially managed with splint immobilization until soft tissue swelling resolves provisional reduction using k wires external fixation can maintain alignment and facilitate soft tissue management until definite fixation can be achieved so the, the goal is to restore the functional anatomy of the foot Rigid fixation is used to recreate the stability of the medial and the middle column. So initially, I told you that the intermediate column is the rigid, is the most rigid, followed by medial. So you want rigid fixation, whereas you can on the lateral column you can use K wires because it's already a bit mobile joint. If relative ankle equineness is not addressed, it can lead to increased loading of the midfoot and theoretically fail to failure of fixation. So this is another uh, uh, X-ray showing various modalities. As you can see, that there is uh, the second and the third. Uh, they are rigid. The intermediate column is rigidly fixed, and the last ray is fixed by K wire. So exposure reduction and fixation generally proceed from proximal to distal and from medial to lateral. Is uh, which things to fix first? You have to understand from this. From medial to lateral, you go. for three column injuries two incision dorsal approach is necessary you have to visualize and then you have to fix 
the dorsal medial incision is centered between the first and second rays and can and it can help to visualize the first TMT and the medial aspect of the second TMT. The dorsal lateral can uh, is centered over the fourth metatarsal and can help visualize the lateral aspect of the second TMT as well as the third and the fourth TMT joints. Reduction of the first TMT, we are uh, discussing medial to lateral we are going. So first TMT is reduced uh, according to the alignment of the dorsal and the plantar cortices with corresponding medial cuneiform. The reduction of the first metatarsal base allows appropriate placement of the second metatarsal base into the mortise. So this is uh, the keystone which we already discussed. So for subtle injuries, uh, not common in our part of the world, so you can use a percutaneous fixation, you can just clamp it up and just uh, throw a uh, home run screw. This screw is also known as the list frank screw. So rehabilitation, rehabilitation, patient is usually counseled that recovery may take up to one year. Post-operatively, the limb is immobilized in a well-padded splint, which is then converted to a short leg non-weight bearing cast. The patient is transitioned to a walking boot at eight weeks with progressive weight bearing. Most patients returns to supportive shoe wear with the use of an arch support eye three months after surgery. So controversies, a small amount of this discussion, whether to violate the joint, whether to spare the joint. So this is a debate. So whether you do an open reduction internal fixation or you do a primary arthrothesis. This is also a debate which is continuously going on in the foot and ankle world. So the most relevant controversy in the management of TNT joint complex is whether to proceed with ORF or primary arthrodesis. In one of the studies, this said that post-traumatic arthritis is 25%. So the author also found a trend towards increased arthritis in patients with purely ligamentous injury, despite an automatic reduction and suggested that this population may benefit from primary arthrodesis. So if you have got purely ligamentous injury, you do arthrodesis. TMT injuries are very uncommon and are frequently mixed. High index of suspicion is necessary. ORIF is the standard treatment of choice. Post-traumatic arthritis, despite of all your effort, post-traumatic arthritis can occur. Although ligamentous injury have benefit from partial arthrodesis, the role of this technique in managing all TMT joint complex has not been determined. So that was all for uh, the list flank part. I think, I think it's time for us to have questions. I think we've had a sort of a quick stop, whistle stop, uh, foot and ankle uh, uh, um, teaching. There was some confusion and misunderstanding. That's why we've delayed it. But I'm, I'm grateful to, to Rizwan Saab, Ashut Kamal Sahil and Tashreen Saab to spare their time and, and take some interest in the students having exams. You guys doing exams must understand that this is a new and developing specialty in Pakistan. Uh, so, so in the exam, make sure that uh, you don't pretend to be uh, the, the be all end all of everything. If you don't understand, you can tell the examiners, I will span it, I will scan it and plan it and come back or even send it to colleagues who do it. This is also a standard exam answer that we do here in England. So uh, I'm, I'm happy if everybody else is happy to ask questions, we will give you a few minutes to ask questions and then we'll call it today. But thank you again, guys. Question time, guys. Anybody wants to ask a question? Anybody wants to ask questions? No. So for the talus fixation, you do a two incision approach, anteromedial and anterolateral, is that correct? Yeah. And uh, which screw to use first, the lateral screw from the antero? So, 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 sorry, yeah. so as a, in a presentation, I told the, the combination, wherever there is combination, you don't use the screw. Otherwise, you will end up in a varus or a valgus mal alignment. So, if it's so I usually do a CT yeah. scan. If it's I usually do a... Yeah, so if, it's a medial, if it's a medial combination, post so combination side you put in a blade. Post row medial combination. Yeah, so medial Pop side, wherever there is a combination, you put in a plate. Don't put a screw there. There are put, very uh, fancy, fancy uh, list frank plates available. I'm sure they're available in Pakistan also, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We have got all sorts of uh, small uh, yeah, 1.5, 2.0, and 2.4 mm plates, the list frank plates, and everything we have got available. So, so a few years ago, in 2008 or 9, when I was doing trauma, for me to put a screw, 
from the big toe metatarsal into to tarsal was very difficult. But I was so happy when the plates came in. Unfortunately, I've given up all trauma. I totally do shoulders now. But, but the plates have been life-saving for me anyway because I could yeah. never get that screw right yet. Okay, so then you do the single incision approach. Is that correct? So uh, you need to understand the point. So uh, mostly there is the medial uh, uh, fracture and a lateral fracture. So the side which is more comminuted, I just put in a plate and the side which is non positional versus lag screw. So it's a combination of screw and a plate. Yeah. Okay. So it is called the a la carte procedure. You, 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 you fix one, have a stable uh, uh, setting on the middle side and then start doing things laterally. They're, they're, most of them could be a divergent, convergent, homolateral or ipsilateral type of you know, classification. So everybody does not need a plate. Everybody does not need a screw. You must yeah. take care of Don't get into that uh, argument. In the exam, tell them that these are injuries which are rare and these are injuries which have to be fixed because the long-term outcome is poor. Once you get that, I'm not sure that you, you can't get into the argument of how many screws you're going to put, what screw size. If the examiners ask you that, then I think it's becoming finicky like this. You need to know the principles, not what screw type and what you're doing and all that, all that kind of stuff for the exams. So is everybody happy? Good. I'm grateful for all of you guys to participating. I'm going to end this and I'm going to put the video uh, on YouTube and copy to all these guys who are uh, here. And then we can hopefully get you guys to join us in the future in a more, uh, um, yeah, um, sort of, um, you know, weekly rather than playing every foot and ankle in one day. Like that. Thank you very much for your time and effort. Tashmin Saab, thank you very much. Rizwan Saab, thank you very much. Arshil, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. This is lovely. Thank you. Thank you.